All right, thank you for the introduction. Like she said, my name is Bernadette Langford and I was the pollution prevention intern at Great Plains Manufacturing. A little bit about Great Plains, they are an agricultural manufacturing company that produce equipment such as tillage equipment, drain, grain drills, and planters and other farm equipment. They're based in Salina, Kansas, but they have 13 facilities, 10 of which are in Kansas and three are internationally located. And they employ over 2000 people. So pollution prevention, the kind of starting point for my projects, pollution prevention describes efforts that reduce, prevent, or eliminate pollution from its source. And this is done by changing the material process or the technology of a system. And we can see the pollution prevention hierarchy here with more preferable actions at the top and less at the bottom. This hierarchy exists because um, as you move down, more, less of the material is able to be recovered and more pollution is involved in recovering those materials. So the motivation behind my projects is that the company that owns Great Plains, Kubota, has inputted um, two major environmental goals for the next few years. The first is that they want all of their North American plants to reduce their CO2 emissions by 9% by 2025. And additionally, they want to be completely carbon neutral by 2050, which is a large task. Additionally, these projects make the manufacturing process more efficient, saving this company time and money. And, <clears throat> excuse me, spreading pollution prevention awareness obviously helps the environment and makes pollution projects more accessible in the future. So the three projects that I was given to work on this summer are oven efficiencies, which deals with um, energy conservation, green energy, which deals with um, source reduction or source pollution reduction, and as well as a technology change there. And then VOC reduction, which also deals with source reduction of pollution and with some material change. So when material first comes into our manufacturing plants, the first go through fabrication where the material is either bent or cut into the shape that it needs to be. And from there, it goes to welding where several small pieces are joined together. After that, it goes into a paint booth where it's coated with either a liquid solvent paint or a powder paint. From there, it goes into a cure oven. Curing is the process in which paint fully bonds to the metal beneath it. And then from there, it goes into a subassembly where all these small parts are bolted together and then into full assembly where the final product is made. So my first project, oven efficiency. Great Plains uses two types of ovens to dry their materials, convection and IR. And they wanted me to figure out which one is more efficient and if we could implement this more efficient oven at some of the other locations. These ovens heat material in two different ways. Convection ovens first heat air, and then they circulate this air around the part, which then dries the paint. And these are used at three locations that I looked at, and all three of these locations use gas to power these ovens. The second oven, the IR ovens, how they heat material is that they emit infrared waves from lamps, and they heat the paint material directly. Um, and these were used at these ovens are used at two locations. One is gas powered and one is electric powered. So infrared ovens are inherently more efficient because they're able to heat the paint directly. However, this is only limited to areas that are in the direct line of sight of those heat lamps. The underside of parts or hidden areas are not as efficiently or effectively heated. And so that's going to be a major concern, making sure that the paint is able to dry on these um, hidden areas. And what both of these ovens are trying to do is to get the material to an elevated temperature and hold it there for a specific amount of time. And this is what's known as its cure temperature. So the most important part of this project was figuring out how material behaves in the different types of ovens. And to do this, I was able to do direct temperature measurements with uh, equipment known as an oven logger. And this involves a touch screen, which um, you're able to track and retain data temperature and time data. Temperature probes, I was able to put directly on painted parts and non-painted parts that went through the oven. And then there's an oven box, which allows the whole system to go through the oven without melting. And so what this oven logger produces is a graph that looks like this. And this graph tracks the temperature of the piece versus time as it goes through the actual oven. And these graphs are able to be divided up into two parts, what's happening while the material is in the oven, versus what's happening when it's out of the oven. So with, the, with these two parts, I decided to calculate its incline slope and its decline slope. 
And in kind scope, this um, describes how the material is being heated and how quickly that's happening while it's in the oven. And the D decline slopes describes how fast it's cooling down once it's out of the oven. An efficient oven will have a high incline slope, meaning it'll be able to heat material quickly, but a low decline slope, meaning that it'll be able to retain the heat it gains and maintain that elevated temperature for a longer amount of time. And this was done by making two triangles out of these graphs and dividing the change in temperature over the change in time. So there are 27, 27 different data sets that this needed to be done on, which took a bit of time. But overall, comparing like materials and comparing the ovens overall, it was found that the gas-powered IR oven was able to heat material the fastest, and it was able to hold on to this heat fairly well. After this, an energy evaluation had to be done. And this takes into account that each oven at every location uses a different amount of energy to run, and it consumes a different amount of energy to heat each part. And so an effective oven will be able to have a high change in temperature, but for a low energy cost. And once again, comparing all the different types of materials and the different ovens, the gas-powered gas IR oven proved most um, capable of this. So from the, all of these um, data and evaluations, I determined that the gas-powered IR oven was the most efficient given its time efficiency and its energy efficiency. So the next step was figuring out if we could implement this at the other locations. However, with this oven replacement or new implementation, I didn't want the quality of the parts leaving the facility to change. So essentially, I wanted those parts to stay at the same temperature for the same amount of time that they currently were with the old oven. And so with this new oven, part, the hardest pro part of this project, uh, sorry, hardest part of this process was figuring out how long each piece needed to spend in the new oven. And efforts were taken here to make sure that those undersides and hidden areas were reaching the cure criteria and getting to the temperature that they needed to be at. So there's three different standards that this new oven could operate at. The maximum holding standard means that the part should spend as much time as the oven as it could to reach that maximum temperature that the old oven got it to. The minimum holding criteria meant that the piece should spend as much time in the oven as it could to reach that minimum cure temperature while still producing a satisfactory result. And then there's also this maximum temperature criteria that needs to be considered. And this, mean, this involves that fact that each all the material should be kept below 250 degrees Fahrenheit or else discoloration will happen as well as paint blistering and this will decrease the quality of the product. This new oven also consumes a different amount of energy, in most cases less energy, which is beneficial. Um, and since products are spending less time in the oven, the production capacity of the oven is going to increase and therefore the production capacity of the entire facility. And since the consumption rate has changed and the time each piece spends in the oven, the amount of money it costs to run each oven is going to change as well, usually a decrease. And if this oven is implemented at the four other locations that I looked at, the company could decrease their energy usage by 14 billion BTUs per year which would be an, an equivalent environmental impact of decreasing the CO2 emissions by 4,000 metric tons each year, which would save the company $25,000. This whole project with all four oven replacements would take about a little over a year and a half. So with all these improvements, I did recommend this project to be carried forward by Great Plains. The second project that I worked on was green energy. Great Plains expressed a desire to offset their electrical usage with some renewable resources. This deals with pollution prevention as the electricity from the generic power grid is coal powered. And so re new, using renewable resources would reduce re the pollution from its source from those coal power plants. So Great Plains could get renewable energy in one of two ways, or I guess you could use both of them. But one of them is to purchase green energy from a wind or um, solar farm. And the other is to um, produce it ourselves. Purchasing power comes through the form of a purchase power agreement. Um, however, this comes at a 20 year contract and the cost of energy is fixed for all 20 years. So this was seen as a less desirable option by Great Plains. As far as producing our own energy, we could use either solar or wind. However, a little bit of research showed that wind is far cheaper in Kansas than solar is. So I move forward with that. 
Installing our own wind turbine, however, it comes with its own installation and capital costs, and each facility would need to have an adequate amount of space and height and restrictions there. So wind turbines generate energy essentially by turning a magnet around a generator. And, and the amount of power it can produce depends on how long each blade is and the um, average wind speed in the area where it's implemented. The cool thing about implementing our own turbine is that this power can go directly to the facility. And a program can be set up with the utility company where if the turbine produces more power than the building needs, the utility company will actually buy off that energy and credit Great Plains. But if the turbine doesn't produce enough com uh, energy, the utility company will provide that extra needed energy that the building needs. There are zoning restrictions involved with um, these wind turbines and also airport approach zone regulations and restrictions. This is kind of the more um, limiting one since a lot of our facilities are near airports. There are several financial incentives available though to help with the cost of these systems. There's a federal tax credit, a tax write-off, and the REIT program, if Great Plains would qualify for it, would be able to provide 25% of the cost to the whole project. So a lot of investigations were done into um, turbine manufacturers and installers, and I narrowed it down to two likely candidates, um, a small wind turbine installer, which you can see is the top picture there, and a micro turbine installer, which is the bottom picture. The small wind turbine installer in an in-person meeting was filed with, and they recommend that we use their 15 kilowatt systems, which produce 45,000 kilowatt hours of energy per year. And these systems are generally about 100 feet tall and last 40 to 50 years. The payback period of, on this is actually quite amazing at only three years. Um, and there's also a rebate opportunity with this co particular company to further help with costs. A micro turbine installer was contacted via email and they recommend that we use their 100 kilowatt systems, which would produce 440,000 um, kilowatt hours of energy per year. These systems are only 30 feet tall, so quite a bit shorter, and they would last 30 years. However, these um, systems are much more expensive with a payback period of 10 years. And given the expense, I decided to move forward with the small wind, wind turbine manufacturer. And so this um, installer recommended that we install six turbines at a non-manufacturing um, facility in Asaria, Kansas. And these would produce 272,000 kilowatt hours of energy per year, which would reduce CO2 emissions by 287 metric tons, saving the company $27,000 per year. And this whole project, all six turbines would be able to be paid off in a little bit over three years. And giving these impacts and savings, I did recommend that they move forward with this project. The last project I worked on this summer was um, a VOC reduction um, research. So VOCs are volatile organic compounds when combined with other pollutants, mainly nitrogen oxides, great ozone. And ozone is a very harmful gas to both the environment and to humans on the surface, lower in that atmosphere on ground level. And so VOCs come from solvents, mainly from the painting process. And these solvents are used in cleaning material before it's painted and in the actual paint. Most of the paint at Great Plains has a 50% VOC content. And so in order to reduce VOCs, um, the amount of solvent used in the painting process should likewise be reduced. And this can be done by changing the painting methods and by changing the painting materials. So the most effective way to reduce pollution in the painting process is to increase the transfer efficiency. Transfer efficiency is the ratio of paint that actually gets on the part versus paint that gets sprayed in the air and wasted. A 10% increase in transfer efficiency can decrease VOC emissions by 25%, which in Great Plains case would be 29 tons of VOC per year, which is quite a bit. The most efficient equipment used for transfer efficiency are electric static spray guns. Um, and this equipment is actually used throughout Great Plains. So we do have the most up-to-date equipment and how this works is that paint is electrically charged when it leaves the paint gun and it's um, attracted to a electrically grounded workpiece. However, for this to work efficiently, everything in the paint booth needs to be grounded. And this includes the conveyor line that all the work pieces are on, the spray gun and the personnel in the paint booth. 
Producing materials that we use can also help reduce the VOC emissions. And this can mainly come from reducing the need to rework or repaint parts. Re the reworking process just creates a lot of waste first in the cleaning materials and the solvents that strip the paint off of the part that needs to be reworked and that paint that is being stripped off that maybe didn't need to be wasted in the first place. Additionally, the, the equipment used in the painting process needs to be cleaned according to its manuals. Um, this ensures that it works properly and effectively. Otherwise, the paint guts could get gunked up and not worked as effectively. And then the cleaning process would take longer, involving more solvent use, producing more VOCs, and it's just this whole long process. The other thing that Great Plains could do is to use more powder paints. Powder paints are very beneficial in that they have virtually no VOC emissions. Um, and they are compatible with the electric static spray guns that we currently use. So there would not be, need to be a um, change of equipment there. And Great Plains also has a recycling um, system set up with these powder paints. So there's no waste associated with them. The drawback with um, powder paints though, is that a, they require much higher temperatures while they're in the ovens, while paint or liquid paints have to be below um, 250 degrees. These powder paints have to be at at least 400 degrees. And so changing over to powder paints would be quite a process and it would have to be evaluated whether it's worth that increase of energy usage from the ovens. Moving forward with this project, I recommend that the grounding of the paint booths be tested more frequently. They should be tested daily. However, I spoke with the paint supervisors at um, many of the plants that's not happening at all, which is really bad because it's such an important part for those electric static spray guns, whether we're using solvent paint or powder paint. Additionally, um, the painting methods need to be observed to make sure that the correct speed and overlap patterns are being used and a method to measure the overspray should probably be developed as well. Overall, this project needs more research. I was not able to complete these observations during my time there. Overall, if Great Plains were to implement all of these projects, they'd be able to reduce their energy consumption by 14 billion BTUs and 272,000 kilowatt hours per year, saving the company $52,000 and reducing carbon dioxide emissions by 4,000 metric tons. Overall, I had a really great experience with this internship. Um, I learned a lot about communication and asking questions and research and lots of calculations, but I would definitely recommend this to someone if they're looking for an internship. Here are my sources, so you know I didn't make it all up. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Hey, I'm, I'm Jeff Sheldon with the Central Link Foundation at the uh, National Library. Uh, I'm, this is more of an observation. I, I, I think it's great. I want to encourage you to research, but I was mentioning a couple of parallels like, mm -hmm. with uh, the ovens, yeah. especially with the red. Yeah. With the money that the government does support to uh, bring these microchip production back to the United States, mm. uh, the infrared ovens in particular are very um, useful in certain for manufacturing. And so that's a place where I think that kind of information on these systems would be teaching that. But that's what, what I'm seeing up there is like immediately that gets thrown into the oh, yeah. for something that's applicable. Oh, yeah. Right. But that's a great opportunity there. Yeah. And then the VOC, uh, it's not often acknowledged in 3D printing. Mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. So being able to monitor for that uh, and kind of respond to that is super useful. But anyway, I just right. want to put that out there because I think that having more information about stuff is not a lot of work to be done. Right. Yeah, definitely further research that could be done there. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. So you mentioned mm -hmm. Yes, so it's like if some the question. Yeah, so the question was, is the rework due to paint related issues? And so the rework is essentially if the paint gets messed up along the process, they have to, how they have it set up right now is they strip the entire part and then repaint the whole thing. And so that's where a lot of the waste comes from. Um. I'm not sure about that. I did research and there are um, there are programs or systems that can allow that help you um, figure out where the source of rework comes from. Um, yeah, but I'm not quite sure about that. Other questions? 
Yeah. So, and I was curious, Kurt, I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit. I've never seen in Kansas a wind turbine that, and we haven't done a, a research on a project like that for a lot of years, that has a payback of three years. Right. Isn't that short? That surprised me, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it was incredible because with the federal tax credits and there's a property, um, I can't remember the term of it, depreciation, that's what it was, mm -hmm. um, as well as if we qualified for that REAP program. The savings were quite astonishing for that project. And I think REAP, I don't think Salina, is, is it Assyria or is it Salina? Um, so the facility that we looked at was in Assyria, and that has to do with how the turbine would be able to affect the cost of electricity because they don't have as high of a demand cost where theirs is just more electric usage. Um, and so since it's more in more rural location, there's a higher likelihood that it would qualify there. And so that information you're gonna pass on to Kurt's group, on to, I, mean, I think Yvonne is helping you with that. Mm -hmm. Some of those calculations, right? Yes. Great, mm -hmm. because I know that application period comes up in October. Mm -hmm. October. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And the um, install, installer that we um, met with has experience writing those grant requests and that application process as well. So he'd be able to do that for the company. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Bernadette? I think you do get no. Oh, go ahead, Jacob. We have time. Yeah. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, not that I've. From what I've been told, no. So essentially, there's like these air vents that kind of like suck the paint out as soon as it either land as soon as it doesn't land on the part, and it's collected. And it's sent to a recycling um, facility. I think it's in Ohio or Indiana, but they don't care what color it is. Um, the pro what they use it for apparently doesn't matter. And so it's sent there where they use it. Okay, so it's not recycled in process, mm -hmm. no which I assume. Buys it. And mm -hmm. there's another company who buys it. We'll probably want to know that for another company that we're working with. Okay. Who's a lot of times you're able to do in process recycling mm -hmm. of that power. Yeah, reusing their and own obviously that's, colors that's and such. Right. Yeah. Uh, but the oven temperature and changes, that's a big part of yeah. your project. Yeah. So, other questions? Yeah. Yes. So you mentioned that you were looking at the temperature curves. Yes. You brought the best oven. Yeah. Right. Um, do you happen to know if the incline makes any effect in the quality of the final product? So if you leave mm -hmm. the temperature too fast, right. the quality. Right. Um, how that might affect the quality is if it reaches that maximum temperature too fast. So I call it the outward facing part, which is able to be heated more quickly. While those undersides or hidden areas are still trying to reach their minimum temperature, if the incline slope is too high, those outward facing parts could reach, could breach that 250 degrees. So that is how something that's too high that's not um, heating the material um, uniformly could have adverse effects. So you, you had to kind of pick up, pick up multiple different points to check the temperature. Mm -hmm. That was a hard data collection process. Yes, yes. There is. So the pigment does call it rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that equipment was really cool to use and it was so helpful because it gave temperature measurements you could set it for like, I think I set it for every second from once I turned it on. So it's very helpful in getting those temperature measurements to make sure. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any ties with the oven control types of the electronics uh, manufacturing process? Yeah. Pre flow oven, right? You go up into different sections of the mm -hmm. like really. Um, I know who the part of the oven that is making sure that those don't have to approach are included in contact. Right. Right. I know in electronics, uh, so we hold the solder. Mm -hmm. so we'll put a little solder with them, and then that would. It's contact. for sure a good contact there. Yes. Um. So when I initially, I don't. There was no like for sure way to like make sure that it had the best contact possible. 
so there were signs that it was getting um, good enough contact because like when I would initially put the temperature probes on the part, those parts are preheated. And so I could see on the touch screen, which shows live temperature measurements, that those that the temperature went up accordingly. So it was getting, um, it was reflecting that change. So kind of assumed that it was good enough. <laughs> Anything else? Other questions? You know, I also wanted to compliment you how you made the connection between, you know, the environment and, and environmental health. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. I know Cohen, you did a, a great job with that too. Um, <clears throat> and just, you know, emphasizing what David Carter said uh, and his welcome is that this is really all boils down to public health when right. you look at environmental. Uh, emissions and reducing them yeah. at the source. So yeah. great job, Myrtle. Thank you.